Have you thought this through? No way will that work. Are you sure? Is there any money in that? You'll never make any money doing that. How are you going to pay the mortgage? Just get a job. Are you going to try to sell that? Why can't you be normal like anybody else? All right. Well, your parents want to? The savvy entrepreneur to the rescue. Congratulations. That really turned out well. I wish I had the courage to follow my friends. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. We're broadcasting here on WLCB 101.5 FM, based in the greater Chicago, Milwaukee area. If you're an entrepreneur or a small business person or you're thinking about becoming one, listen up because this show is for you. I'm Doris Nagel, your host for the next hour. The Savvy Entrepreneur Show has two goals. First, to share helpful information and resources. I've been an entrepreneur. I have made so many mistakes. I've had clients and friends who've made lots of mistakes. So if I can help just a couple of you out there avoid some of the mistakes that I've seen or that I've made, then I'm successful. The second goal is to inspire. I found being an entrepreneur confusing, often lonely. You have no idea sometimes if you're on the right track or not, or where to turn for good advice. So to help with both those goals, every week on the show, I have guests who are willing to share their stories and their advice. And this week, I have not one, but two guests, the co-founders of Do Well Brands, Malika and Mike Wells. And they are joining me here today to tell about their story and how they created their business and some of the challenges they've experienced and successes along the way. So with that introduction, Malika and Mike, welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. Thanks for being with me today. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having us. us. I am delighted you're here. So, you know, first tell people a little bit about your backgrounds, both of you, and, you know, how you came to start your own business because it's, you know, it's not an easy journey. And, you know, what was it about your backgrounds and your, you know, your makeup that, led you to want to do this well my background um man i've just always been wanting wanting to be in business for for myself like uh i sold candy in um high school um i was a personal trainer for years um i kind of always wanted to work for myself and kind of whatever work i was going to do i wanted to be for me um my uh parents owned a business uh, they owned a bakery oh. uh, um so i uh, i saw how an in-home business can kind of grow into something and i could and i also saw how the the strain of that business could cause difficulty in the um home so i saw kind of both ends of it yeah um mike mike did you work in the the family bakery you say work in it yeah i used to help deliver um orders like when uh we like we used to have contracts with uh jan j fish pizza uh ribs and things um and a lot of other uh different um fast food restaurants out south and um i used to go on all the orders i used to actually see that and we used to get free food sometime <laughs> um and so that was just kind of a thing and um so that that just kind of had me in in like a business type of mind frame i went to hampton university for business management um and um I've just kind of been in business for myself all this time. <laughs> yeah. Well, it it certainly helps when you come from a family of entrepreneurs because 
you're you see that people can make make a great living doing that what about you malika what's your background what what makes you tick? <laughs> so um similar to mike i always wanted to work for myself i always used to say i'm going to be a business owner before i really understood what a business owner was <laughs> Um, you know, I was like, I'm going to school for business because I'm going to be a business owner. And I ended up in college and went to school for interior design instead. <laughs> wow. So, so um, my background is mostly on the design and logistics side. So what I loved about interior design was the space planning, um, making spaces functional. So then after interior design, I moved into event design and event planning. And I really fell in love with like the logistics of putting things together and making things look pretty, but also making things efficient. And that led me to uh, working for one of Chicago's larger event production companies. And that's where I was when I met Mike and no, that's not where I was when I met Mike, but that's where I was when we got married. <laughs> Uh, well, so you're you're a process person, it sounds like. Yes, I'm very much a process person, the details person. You um, don't say. And <laughs> after working for that company for about four years, I was getting a little disenchanted with it and with working for someone else. And I kept saying, I need to go back to working for myself, even if it's just freelancing for other companies. And then Mike came up with this happened. idea that we needed to start a business. And I was like, well, I've kind of got one foot out the door anyway. Yeah, like I, so, so is that how Do Well Brands was born? Or at that point, were you looking at? Well, it was levels to it. it. It was kind of a confluence of a, of a few things. Um, I was getting out of the fitness industry. So I was kind of getting disenchanted with that. And then I opened up a juice bar. So like I, I ran wow. a juice a bar, juice a bar. mobile. Well, no, it was like a mobile juice bar that actually, it wasn't mobile because it was in one spot. We were at um, the LA Fitness um, in um, in my neighborhood. And they actually allowed me to run a juice bar there. Uh, I, I, I think I started out three days a week. Then it turned out to be every day. Um, well, that and sounds what like happened, a pretty good opportunity, though. You, yeah, but what happened a- was it wasn't a sustainable um, situation. But but what it did was it got me th- looking at beverages as like a way to do something good. Yeah. Um, and so what happened was I started to make smoothies and sell those and bottle those on, you know, my own. I, I had a um, taffy apple smoothie that tastes just like a taffy apple. It was de- Oh, it was man, delicious. that sounds good right now, actually. It, it was, was very good. It was really good. Uh, but, but the thing was, it was a bit expensive to make and hard to kind of make it taste the exact same every single time. And so I decided so I needed something else. I didn't know what that was. Now we fast forward to Thanksgiving 2017. 17, yes. 17. I made some lemonade for Thanksgiving. And the most involved the most lemonade. Involved ever. lemonade she had ever seen <laughs> in her life. And what happened was they loved it. And then maybe a few weeks later, like I, we kind of looked at each other and kind of thought, oh man, if we want to go into business, lemonade's overhead isn't really that bad. It's a lot better than smoothies and protein shakes. Huh, ding, the light just kind of went off and uh, we came up with, with um, flavors. We came up with a, a name. And we just decided to start it. Um, what was the first well, this, thing we this did? process definitely took months. It took months. Like, I don't it wasn't want anybody like, to think we did It happened in like a week. No, yeah. no, <laughs> this all was kind of like a layered process that kind of all came together uh, in June of 2018. Mm-hmm. Well, how, how did you know there was a market for 
your lemonade? Because there's lots of lemonades out there. There's lots of beverages. How did you know there was a market for you to tap into? Well, for us, we are we are our customer. We're like, we are our, our target market because we are more conscious about what we eat. We like to read the labels and we just weren't seeing a lot of those beverages, at least in our community. We weren't seeing a lot of beverages that were all natural and completely free of like dyes and artificial sweeteners and things of that sort. So we wanted to create something that we didn't see and bring it to our our neck of the woods <laughs> because you know there are similar products but those weren't very popular in in our um neighborhood in our community so we wanted to be able to bring that to our community and also give flavor profiles that were different than what you saw on the shelves they weren't just single flavor like peach lemonade strawberry lemonade we wanted to make sure we infused other um flavors. herbs and flavors because that's that's what we like and we wanted to introduce something new to the palate to you know people's palates that they yeah, may not have absolutely. considered before we also noticed that the um craft industry as a whole was kind of booming at that at that time so you had like craft beers craft yep. ciders uh yep. craft seltzers yep hard um, ciders yep. um mm -hmm. the the beverage industry was kind of in this um this transitional space where people are now wanting something a little different and not just coke and pepsi anymore no um, i i just got hooked on Kem. Kombucha, is that how you say Damn, it? Oh, you're right. Kombucha. Right. I, I never good. heard of it before, but somebody said, oh, it's really good for your gut we've health. We've actually so been drinking kombucha okay. forever. Like me and her, we've been drinking kombucha for a really I long time. I think I tried kombucha for the first time in when I was working at Mariano's. Yeah, like that was like a <laughs> I had, decade I had ago. a quick stint at Mariano's. <laughs> and that's the first time I tried kombucha. Yeah. I just yes. bought one that, you know, right. on a whim as I was checking out a Whole Foods. I mean, it was like, oh, yeah. okay. But and there's so many options now. There were not that many options when we first The market is it. saturated now. It, yeah. it's, it's, it's kombucha this, kombucha that. It's similar to how seltzers were in like 2019. Like, just seltzers every just right. everybody had their own their own seltzer but you know it'll thin out and kind of balance it I, so I suspect you go to something you're, else yeah i suspect you're right so how did you get started selling your products and figuring out the strategy of going Absolutely. to market i mean there's obviously the pricing issue too and mm -hmm. sourcing of ingredients and things like that i mean you alluded to the pricing you can make things that taste wonderful, but if people won't pay for them, that's a challenge. So how, how did you kind of take, go from concept to really making regular sales? Uh, well, you want to take, <laughs> yeah, I mean, markets probably was the first thing we did. We had this, uh, wonderful opp opportunity called box called Boxville, um, where they actually took, uh, shipping, containers and turn them into like viable business spaces oh, um, and they would do like and they mm -hmm. would do like a market every wednesday and every saturday so that kind of gave us a chance to slowly introduce it and get everything going and what we realized was that people they they, they didn't just like the the product it wasn't like every now and again somebody says they like it every single person oh i love this oh i love that and so at that point we were also doing food so we had that whole thing going sandwiches along with beverages people just ate it up literally literally uh, ate it up yeah yeah and so then we had a friend who had a restaurant and wanted to sell sell the beverages in the restaurant. So that's how we got into the bottling aspect. Ah. And, and, and then so, we also sold in like another local store mm -hmm. um, that Will focused Lyle. on selling only black owned, black made products. So that was the Black Mall. Oh, right, the Black, black Mall, right. And then we got into 
to another restaurant. So we kind of started growing from there because people would either see that we were selling our product somewhere and say, hey, you could sell it over here too. Or they would ask if they we could carry, they could carry our products. But to your question, what you don't realize, because that was before we even had a website, before we had <laughs> like, before we had really done. Well, we, by the time we started selling the lemonades in stores, we had a website. Right, okay. But it wasn't as as robust as it is It was not as, it as now. robust. It was very... It was real simple. Very simple. Uh, <laughs> but it was... Um, then you start to now you can't make this stuff at home now because now you got well i was just gonna say i mean when you're talking bottling i mean it's one thing okay i buy some plastic cups and lids and you know i have my imported a cup and and hand it to people at a farmer's market but bottling is a whole different yeah i mean i believe that once we phase food out like once we became do well brands as opposed to do well sandwich company because that was our because that was our first name because we actually use sandwiches as like a conduit to sell our beverage right but then you realize people love the beverages right yeah and the overhead for the food didn't necessarily match up with the profit margin and it was better to just to just really focus on the beverage end of it because of the um, the legs that the beverage have versus the food. It was yeah. a, it was a lot better in terms of uh, growth potential and scale. Yeah. Well, so did you face any kind of like regulatory challenges? I mean, once you start bottling stuff. I'm just in, I don't know that much about the food and beverage industry. Well, the biggest challenge was when the kitchen that we had, uh, (laughs) that we had. Oh, when we first first made the decision to move into a commercial kitchen. Man. And like shared kitchen spaces are a a popular thing now. So I think the city had just kind of came up with this concept not to not too long before we looked into like where we can produce our products. Yeah. And we found a kitchen that was like perfect. absolutely perfect. Oh, it was so good. It had all the equipment you needed. Oh. It was just beautiful. They Dreamy. had they were helpful with receiving deliveries and things like that. And we go for a tour and we sign up and we're like gung ho like yes we, we can do money it. And everything. We're gonna figure out how to pay for this kitchen every month, right? Because they wanted us to sign a six month contract, we put a deposit down. I think what the next that Tuesday, week, the following week, the guy who no, it was on Sunday. It was on a Sunday. Yeah, the the yep, following week, the guy who had signed us up, he said, "Hey, I'm just gonna let you know this: the business from, is closing from his personal email. You better try to get your deposit back." What? I'm talking about. We were start. And we were ready to start. We business would not that have week. known unless he told us. And he only he was rushing to tell us before they shut his email down because they had gone bankrupt or something, and they just completely shut down the business, oh. laid everybody off. So what did you do? So, so ironically, the same lady who gave us that tour, she had got another job. At that's where, not how we found out about that. Oh, that's not how no. we found out. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, change that. So it just happened. Cut. <laughs> that's how he remembers it. <laughs> but another business owner had let me know about the hatchery. Because we were, you know, we had a meeting. We were just talking about stuff. And she was like, oh, there's this new space, this new kitchen space opening. But they weren't open yet. And when that happened, we were like, well, let's look into the hatchery this is supposed to be a new brand new shared kitchen space incubator space but they didn't open for like another three months but they let us come in and do a tour and it turned out that the same person who worked at the (laughs) who was like the kitchen manager at the place that shut down had just got hired to be the kitchen manager at the hatchery and she still works there now. And she still day. works there now. Well, so if you had to figure out for three months how to limp along, I guess. Yeah. And we we had another kitchen space that we uh, could work out of. It just wasn't ideal. So when the hatchery opened, it was like the best timing because we were working out the other kitchen during our slow season, which I mean, we were brand new. We so slow new, so- season was very, very slow. Yeah. <laughs> 
so you were you're, barely doing anything at that point. You're, you're not the first to have sung the praises of the hatchery. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your experience with them and how how they've helped you. So they've been helpful because they are, well, for one, they are a nonprofit organization. The other organization was for profit. Um, and they have, they work in collaboration with another organization that, um, or I guess their, their parent organization, um, ICNC, they all, they're all about supporting small businesses, especially businesses with owners from underserved communities. So the South side, the West side, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, and they provide kitchen space, shared and private kitchen spaces. But in addition to that, they offer, they offer workshops, courses, one-on-one coaching. And this is all pretty much financial assistance, Yeah, financial assistance. They, um, they have experts come in all the time to talk about marketing and how to get capital and, um, all kinds of business related topics. They have panels, networking events every month. So they have countless opportunities for you to learn more as a small business. And then the staff also is very supportive. So when they hear of grants or um, loans or any other kind of um, events, even like trade shows, things of that sort, they are always informing the businesses that work out of the hatchery about these opportunities so they can grow. Well, and I know like this sounds interesting. I know this sounds petty, but it's clean. <laughs> it's clean. That's very important. <laughs> I know like all of them should be, but they're not. Hey. So I really, and you can, you see them working on stuff every, every day. Someone's in, in there cleaning up something, doing something. If you ask them to like do something, they're there. It's just yeah. really, really great. Great customer service. <laughs> Well, you know, you, you've um, kind of built up a, a, a natural lead into a couple of follow-on questions, one of which is about finding the right resources. One of the mm-hmm. common themes with people that I've talked to and had as guests on the show is that they've struggled sometimes to find resources, you know, a, people who can get answers to their questions, but it sounds like the hatchery was really filled a lot of those roles for you well we still i mean as a business owner you don't know what you don't know till you don't know it right (laughs) and for sure so it's one of those things where the hatch you can't do everything there is there are still some resources that we lack like we still look for mentors in the beverage industry in general um and we still look for um resources in terms of relationships uh partnership relationships um putting those things together is probably what we focus on the most outside of what they can do for us Mm -hmm. so and and how do how do you find those people um, How have you been in, in the mix? I mean, doing that. COVID kind of threw us off a little bit because it was great that it did because we because we got to do a nice pivot that was necessary. However, it took us out of our most comfortable space, which which was in front of people. Yeah, and being able to kind of sell and kind of really touch the people and almost network and yeah. and that right. was our network mm-hmm. right um so yeah, i mean talk about t- talk about perfect market research you get such immediate feedback right each and every person you serve that's amazing right yeah and we also would get a lot of business from those um customers because yep. they would say oh I work for such and such and yep. we could have you do this, this, and this, or we're look, we're trying to do a employee appreciation event and we can hire you to do this. And, and so then we would kind works. of get like small catering gigs and, um, cause that's how we, is that how we got that job? But, um, the, which one? The, <laughs> the school, the one that we got, uh, feeding this. The school yes. We, yeah. We did one summer. We did a, it was a four week program for school children 
and we did the lunches for them every day. And it was like 300 lunches a day. Oh, how fun. Yeah. Not fun at all. Cause that, that, <laughs> was, that, that, that was, was our was, first major. That project. was, that was the job though, that ended food for us. <laughs> Well, it was the beginning of the end. That's what no more sandwiches for, for kids. It Done. was the beginning of the end. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we realized that food was not necessarily how we wanted to go about our days. That that that's all. Well, even good, though we were good at. Good that you found that out early. You know, the other follow up question I that you made me think about was funding. Um, mm -hmm. How how did you fund all of this? Ha! Ah! Our pockets. Our money. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. In the very beginning, quite honestly, <laughs> it was not very expensive to start. Yeah. I mean, you pay your your registration with the state of Illinois. You pay for your food service certificate. And okay, I mean, it's not really that wasn't. Yeah, and we wasn't got a, a million dollar we got a little business. Cheap we started. Website. Yeah. yeah, we <laughs> we started stuff. off basic. So we've always wanted to be in control of our situation. And when it came to whether it be a loan, whether it be an investment, we wanted to always just kind of be leery of loaning and kind of dealing with the whole debt aspect of it until we felt like it was necessary. Um, as well as we wanted to get our business to a space where we could have some some leverage within any type of negotiation as far as like investment or anything like that, because we just felt like the more we learn through our bumps and kind of kind of fight through this thing ourselves, we feel like we get stronger in terms of the uh, the things that we get out of the beverage game if you yeah. will. well there's no question that once you have external investors uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch pardon that's the pun. Right. <laughs> i guess that's an appropriate pun for for you guys but um you know they they have their hooks in you and then they're gonna have a significant say over and, it, and how it's not becoming what it what started to be yeah. How do you see your business? How has it grown since you started? And what do you see for the future? I mean, what, what will your business look like, let's say, in a couple of years if you're successful? Well, you know, we've grown to the point where I can walk down. I, I, can, I can drive down the street and see somebody drinking our beverage. Oh, that's so cool. And that was and that was a really cool uh, moment. I'll say then the next two years, we want to be a national brand. We want to be on everybody. We, we want to be part of whatever trend is going on. And um, we, we actually want to be tongues uh, verbally and physically of every single <laughs> person that we can. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how do you think you'll get there? I mean, you know, cracking some of these, it's one thing to have word of mouth and a handful of restaurants or maybe farmers markets and food markets, but to scale this and try to get it, you know, and I, I had a friend who had a natural chip product and he was always complaining, I was going to say griping, but yeah, he was <laughs> probably doing that too, about how hard it was to kind of crack the key spaces in some of the big retailers. So I got one word for you. Yeah. Relationships. Ah. At the end of at the end of the day, everybody has something to sell. Everybody has a product. Um, some products are better than better than others, but the thing that kind of gets you, I mean, we we live in a we live in a world that is kind of nepo, nepotism based. Yeah, um, that's for and sure. Not, and not just, you know, family, but, you know, you, if you're in the right circles and the right people taste your beverage, it can go through the roof. So you need a little bit of luck and the proper relationships. Um, and if we just remain consistent and continue to do what it is that um, 
that, you know, we do, which is make fantastic beverages, then we think that the rest will kind of take care of itself. Well, I know from talking to Malika before the show that you have pivoted. In fact, you even talked about one of the pivots that you've done, which was starting in sandwiches and then deciding that wasn't where you wanted to go. How do you see yourself pivoting? I mean, there's a lot of directions you can mm-hmm. go in, um, you know, different kinds of beverages, more flavors, more markets, I mean, mm-hmm. more products. So talk about that. So as you mentioned, we already pivoted our business model from food and beverage <laughs> to just beverage. And funny enough, we've pivoted again <laughs> to food and beverage, um, except now we offer something that is a little more intentional and in alignment with what our intention as a business is because, well, our name is Do Well. And we named the business Do Well because we wanted whatever we offered to not only do well, like in business and sell well and things like that, but also offer um, like a better for you option right. than what was commonly known or commonly provided. So right now we're working on different product lines within our beverage offerings. We offer fresh salads now for like local catering and um, we'll be getting back into markets this summer now that the pandemic has kind of slowed down just a little bit and we'll be getting back in front of people and doing like some more, some live action service. Um, And then we also have services that we want to start introducing. So we're kind of um, flushing out all of these ideas to have a full line of brands underneath underneath the Do Well brand's name. And it's not just lemonade, but it'll be the lemonade, the mixers, the salads, maybe some merchandise and um, classes, things like that. Wow. Well, you, you know, you mentioned, I think, when we chatted before the show, and I saw on your website, too, that you have mixers. Yes. Talk about how that came to be. So that was that pandemic pivot. Yeah, that was part of the <laughs> pandemic pivot. That was the pandemic So that pivot. same well, like, year, drink, so in 2020. Drink, ha- like drink officially- heavily. I'm just laughing. I'm thinking drink heavily. Is that? <laughs> oh, well, it kind of was because <laughs> we had recently launched um, our e-com- like e-commerce. People were able to order online now. And then pandemic hit and we were like, well, thank God we have a website where people can order online because now they can't come to us and buy it. And we were, instead of doing the markets, we were like, we need to stay in touch with our, our people, like our consumers, our customers. So we started a virtual happy hour on Instagram live. And how creative, what a great idea. And we would demo a cocktail that used our lemonade because we didn't have the mixers yet. We use the lemonade as the mixer. We will create a little cocktail kit that people could order in advance and mix along with us. And we would go live, mix the drink and just chit chat pretty much on Instagram live. And then from that, I started thinking like, well, why don't why we? don't we make an actual mixer for the drinks instead of always having to use lemonade? Let's use something that can make the drink a little bit more um it gives you a little more room for imagination and creating different types of drink instead of it always being a lemonade and vodka a lemonade and rum and it gives the drink body (laughs) yeah Yeah. wow very cool so that's where the mixers were born and then um so we have the mixing syrups which we actually use for more than just mixers for drinks but can also be used as toppings for like your ice cream or pancakes, you can mix it into your baked goods. You can glaze a salmon or chicken wings, or you can do a whole bunch of things. Wow. Put it in your tea, your coffee, you know. Very cool. She makes this fantastic peanut butter and jelly tasting ice cream where she puts Mm, like the syrup on there (laughs) and mixes in some peanut butter. It's like 
amazing. Crunchy well, peanut butter. Crunchy it's peanut nice. butter. Um, you gotta have the peanuts well, in there. Well, well, one thing that's very clear in talking to the two of you, and kudos to you, you are both obviously very ready and willing to try lots of new ideas. And, you know, I think that's, I think that's a, a really important thing for entrepreneurs. Yeah, it's important, too, to know when to stick to your guns and keep doing more of the same. But uh, particularly, it strikes me in the food and beverage industry where people's tastes change and, you know, the, the restaurant chain or brand that's super hot this month you know two mm-hmm. years later it. is just never not even around yeah. so you have to i think keep uh keep things fresh in that industry would you agree definitely i mean if you're not adjusting you're dying man and and you actually talked 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 about it with the with the uh restaurant industry that industry is something that I've watched since I've been in the beverage industry now, just kind of watched it really closely. And, and you were spot on. I've seen that hot restaurant that everybody loved that summer, the next summer, not even be there. Yeah. And so that, I mean, that's actually why we never really, we didn't focus on getting a brick and mortar um, because of, I mean, some, some of it was, was fear ish, but a lot of it had to do with kind of the functionality of the industry and starting out, you don't want to have that type of pressure to have to do something. You want to be able to have time to be able to flex and pivot and do some things differently. And I think had we had a brick and mortar that had rent every do every day, we had staff, I think we wouldn't have been able to flush out our business the way we really, really wanted to. Um, And I think that we would not be as further along with the detailed stuff that we are now. Well, there's no question about having a a brick and mortar store. There's a certain, I don't know, cachet that goes with it. You know, it's like, Ooh, here's our store. And we everybody's happy until they got to keep on, going every day (laughs) right but i mean but it ties you down a lot and probably early on especially as you're still experimenting with products and uh business models and you know go to market strategies it's i think it's probably smart that you're not you're not tied down by that so thank my wife though for that she's 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 the one that drilled that into my head (laughs) i had to kind of learn that you know, so yes, so mwah, love yes, you. He was, he had his heart <laughs> sold on getting the storefront. <laughs> ah, that's pretty funny. Well, so for the two of you, what's been the best part about having your own business? Being able to be with our children. We were just talking about that today. Yeah, talk um, a little bit about that. You, you've <laughs> had a couple of new arrivals, which yeah, yeah like, a couple is right. A couple is correct. <laughs> yeah, twins and in August. Yeah, and it's so interesting because I couldn't imagine having to be at like a nine to five job where I wouldn't be able to do some of the things that I'm, I'm able to do with them throughout the day um, and be able to have that bonding time with them that's really really uh important at this time and she actually just uh brought it up today and i i hadn't really thought about it that deeply but yeah that's uh, that's definitely the best thing we got is our freedom of time so we can be able to do that yeah what about you malika what's been the best thing for you the same or something else well, to piggyback off of what Mike said, the freedom um, and the fle- the flexibility, but also seeing something that you may grow into like a real live, viable, breathing thing. It's almost like having a child, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. you have a child and you get to see them grow up and starting a business is very similar. You started out with this little idea and then you turn around years later and you're like, oh, my little idea is now this really big idea yeah, or several big ideas. <laughs> right. Well, and, so, and your, your business is so uh, tangible, I guess. You know, I mean, you you yes. literally at these events get to see 
immediate feedback. People smile, the smiles on their faces and, you know, their positive feedback. I mean, a lot of businesses, you don't get that kind of immediate gratification. So I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that piece of it is is often really rewarding. Well, I think too, what a lot of businesses don't quite understand. And you know, what, what I was saying earlier, everybody has something to sell. So a lot of times the thing that differentiates it comes down to maybe one or two different things. People love us. So like when they come to these different festivals on top of them getting something delicious, they get our personality, they get our uh, energy because we really try to make sure we give them that and make sure that when they um, leave, they're like, man, I remember when, man, I saw do well, um, because I, I think us is one of our greatest value because yeah. I, I, I think people love us on top of the product. To the point right. where we go by Mr. and Mrs. Do Well. <laughs> and that's well, I can certainly it. see it. You have been a delight to have on my show. And uh, I have just been smiling the whole time. You, you know, I know both of you for, uh, have done some mentoring. You feel pretty strongly about helping other entrepreneurs. Talk a little bit about your mentoring and how you do that and some of the advice that you offer to them, some of the common issues you see. You mean mentoring from a business, other, other business owners or you talk yeah. about youth or whatever. Oh, um, yeah. Um, the, what happens is again, shout out to the hatchery. I, I know when I'm there, I get to talk like, for instance, miss, there's this wonderful, um, business called miss b's patties like you gotta uh please look her up she has fantastic beef and shrimp patties like uh jamaican, jamaican patties. style yeah. patties they are delicious um i um talk to her a lot about her uh marketing share share with her some of our different experiences and things like like that um, also, we also partner with with different with different businesses. Also, Tubby's Tubby's Tastes, um, uh, Bottle Bottle Bees Cakes and Ice Cream, and we share information and we share best uh, practices. Um, and you know, we kind of help each yeah, other. Yeah, we're all kind of growing way. together, but we all have different levels of experience or different experiences so we share our um what we've learned our through our journey. business journey with each other and in addition to the partnerships with the other businesses and mentoring we also want to mentor or we do mentor younger aspiring entrepreneurs so people who haven't quite started a business or they have started a business teenagers, young adults who are interested in getting in business and have the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial spirit. That word always trips me up. Well, um. I'm, I'm, I'm curious too, you know, because the hatchery, as you said, is, is really trying to serve disadvantaged communities or mm -hmm. what I would say are underrepresented entrepreneurs. I mean, there right. is no question. It's a very sad fact that, that women owned businesses are receive such a small percentage of venture capital money. Uh, you know, entrepreneurs owned by people of color and immigrants really underrepresented what are some of the specific challenges that you've seen and any words of advice for those folks or words of encouragement? I would say we, we didn't really know much about the capital, how to build capital, starting a business. And that's partially because we grew up in a community where it wasn't widely known knowledge. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't widespread knowledge. It wasn't discussed in school as much as, you know, other communities may have experienced or even knowing someone who go, who's gone through the process. We didn't know much about venture, venture capitalists, investors. We have heard of it. We've watched Shark Tank, of course, 
but it's just not, um, it's not common knowledge. So when you start a business, you don't realize all the opportunities are all the options there are for building capital. And then you realize that a lot of these companies who get that capital are white men. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, the ones, and part, part of the ones reason, that are connected, you know, well, right. Part of the reason people don't know about it is because even if they did know and they tried, they wouldn't be successful. So that they wouldn't be successful because they don't have the relationships that yeah. have been fostered over generations. And, yep. you know, so it's just, it's a, it's a really sad cycle. And it, I do see a shift happening where more, um, people of color and women-owned businesses are given opportunities to be able to get into those spaces and learn more about those spaces. And they're like, um, oh, completely th- uh, accelerator programs and yeah. things like that, where they will teach you and show you and give you connections with other business owners who have already gone through it and teach you all of the things that you need to know in order to advance your business, which is great. But, you know, it's just historically those groups have been disadvantaged and we got to play catch up. And how, how, do, how do we, how do we change that though? Well, to that point, what, what she was saying, that being the case, it creates um, this. It's like as business owners, they tell themselves what they can't do before they even know that they can't do it. So right. you don't even go look for a loan. So you don't even look for different resources because you have been taught through your ex experience that oh, I'm not going to get this yeah. thing anyway. Banks don't loan black so it don't money. really matter. matter. Yeah. So like, like I met a young uh, lady who had a fantastic product and she just doesn't want, she didn't realize how easy it was to get into the, um, get into the hatchery. Um, and she was like, I don't, don't, I just don't know. But that's because she assumed that it was going to be out of her price range, assumed that it was going to be no way she would do it. So I believe a lot of the things is that a lot of people need to just kind of jump out there and kind of learn, learn the different, the yeah. different programs, resources that are actually out there and get the ball going and stop focusing on what can't be done. Well, I think there's something to be said for um, helping build things one brick at a time. And Mm -hmm. I'm glad the two of you are out there, you know, helping build those, build those bridges and um, wet those whistles, (laughs) (laughs) wet those whistles. So, you know, we're, we're, we're almost out of time. I, the hour has absolutely flown by. I feel like I could just sit down and have a lemonade or a cocktail with the two of you pretty much so, yes, any day. We'll well, now get... we got to get you on Thirsty Thursday now. See, there you told us. Okay. Yes, it's now. a deal. It's a you. deal. So I got to let you have a minute to tell people who are listening in how they can reach you or find out more about your product. So, so tell everybody, tell listen up. That. Attention right now. <laughs> I want you to go to dowellbrands.com Take it from me, Mr. Do Well and Mrs. Do Well. You will not <laughs> regret it. You can get your favorite beverages, your mixers, get, get, get you a few craft salads, and join our, our email list so you can find out what's going on with us every month yes, every on month. <laughs> dowellbrands.com. And you can check us on Instagram at dowellbrands.com. No, not dot com. Oh, you know what Do I mean. Do well brands. Well underscore brands yes. is our Instagram handle. And it's Do Well Brands on Facebook. <laughs> well, and it sounds like uh, folks should look for your podcast soon, too. Yes. Yeah. Thirsty Thursday coming up one day. Coming up I, soon. I can't wait. And I'd be happy to be a guest. Mike and Malika, thanks so much for being with me today. It's been a delight having you. Thank um, you. The co-owners and co-founders of Do Well Brands, thanks again for being on the show. My pleasure. Yes, we had a great time. Sure did. And you have a wonderful voice. I could I could talk to you for a long time, too. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, thank you. I uh, I will say this. I love doing it. I'm so blessed to be able to talk to so many amazing people, you included. So it's just fun to hear about different entrepreneurs on their journey. And I love connecting other entrepreneurs who have been guests or that I've chatted with. I'll always keep you in mind too. Before I sign off for this week, I wanted to highlight what I view as the absolutely pathetic, sad state of startup funding for women-owned businesses, especially businesses started by women of color. Now, the good news is that women of all stripes are starting more businesses than ever. In 2021, the U.S. government says that nearly 47% of new businesses were founded by women. That is great. And women of color are starting businesses at an even faster clip. The number of firms owned by African-American women has grown 164% since 2007. And in fact, is the biggest demographic starting new companies, the fastest in all the United States. And while that's good, it's not all good news. Funding for all women-owned startup businesses has continued to decline. In 2019, the percentage for all women-owned businesses who received funding was a pathetic, paltry 2.6%. Well, that's pretty awful in 2019. I really thought we were a little more enlightened than that. But sadly, the number went down to 2.3% in 2020. Well. That's got to be an anomaly, right? 2021 had to be better than that. Wrong. The percentage was under 2% in 2021. And that's despite the fact that 2021 was an absolute blockbuster year for venture funding. In fact, the total of funding that all women-owned startup businesses received in 2021 was less than the funding that one single company, Robinhood, received. And that's similar to 2020, where again, the total that all women startup businesses received was less than the funding for WeWork. Now, ironically, WeWork has already pretty much cratered. And if you're reading the news, Robinhood has not done very well lately. So really, what gives? Robinhood and WeWork are more valuable than all the women startups combined out there? That seems pretty unlikely. And it's not that women-owned businesses do poorly for venture capitalists. A recent study showed that women-owned businesses who did get venture funding returned 78 cents on the dollar invested, while male-owned businesses only about 31 cents on the dollar. Something needs to change, and I'm really curious what you out there think needs to be done to change this. Clearly, we do need more women venture capital partners, and that is happening. But we need funds that are biased towards women entrepreneurs. There are a handful out there, but we need a lot more. Women also need a helping hand to coach them on how to find the right venture and angel funding, and also how to pitch more effectively to these people to speak their language. This will help women entrepreneurs in general, but I don't know. I'm not sure anyone's really looked at whether that's sufficient. If if it helps all women of entrepreneurs, will it help the entrepreneurs who are women of color or women who are vets or immigrants? I don't know if the rising tide is sufficient to raise all boats. There's a lot of work to be done in this area, no doubt about it. I want to continue this conversation. I welcome your comments and suggestions. I'm going to address this either in future segments or perhaps a blog post or two or feature comments from some of my guests. Now, one last thing before I wrap up today, I'll get off my soapbox, but I want to drop in a word for our station, WLCB. They are a nonprofit radio station. And just like NPR and PBS, we depend on listener support from listeners just like you. And it's super easy to donate. You just go to www.lakes, plural, lakesradio.org, click the donate button. If you're interested in being a sponsor, we'd love to talk to you about advertising on WLCB. Just reach out to me at dnagel at lakesradio.org 
or go to the contact us page on the website and someone from the station will get back to you. A final thank you to Mike and Malika Wells of Do Well Brands, my guest on the show this week. And thank you to my listeners. You're the reason I do this. You Mm -hmm. can find helpful information and resources on my consulting website, which is globalocityservicesplural.com. And I have a new radio show dedicated website, thesavvyentrepreneur.org. There's a library there of blogs and tools, podcasts, other free resources for small business people and entrepreneurs. And... Because the show is for you, my door is always open for comments, questions, suggestions, or just to shoot the breeze. Email me at dnagel, N-A-G-E-L, at thesavvyentrepreneur.org. You'll always get a response back from me. Now, be sure to join me again next Saturday at 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern. But until then, I'm Doris Nagel, wishing you happy entrepreneuring.